Today we are simulating to the MLB draft, or at least until the week before the MLB draft, we'll have our final draft preview today and to pass the time while we get there. I'm going to try out the new feature here, the custom game entry conditions. We haven't done that yet, so let's try it here today. We get our first one here. We're down by one, two runners on base here. Bottom of the eighth, can Tyler Locklear, who was excellent the last time we took a look at the Major League roster. Here he strikes out, though. We leave our runners stranded. And now we have to try and come back here in the ninth inning. Down by a run. Diving attempt there by Colby Thomas. Can't quite replicate the diving play he made back in our opening day game. Pete Crow Armstrong hits this one deep to right field. It's back and it is past the wall. And gone. That will extend the Chicago Cub lead to 4-1 to one here. And I think that's going to pretty much wrap this game up. I don't know if we could come back from this deficit, only having scored one run in the first eight innings. It is course filled, so maybe I shouldn't have put it past us to do it. But, you know, not every game is going to be like that Padres game where we can just score a bunch of runs in an inning, not with this offense at least. So we fall in our first critical situation here. To the Cubs. Week 7 of scouting. Jason Lindsay up to 95% now. Is up to number 5 on our board. And I've got to say. Even though he's not a power hitter. He's somebody that's going to be on my short list. For number 4. Even you know a Rocky series needs a leadoff hitter. Um, not you know. All 9 positions in the lineup need to have power at them. So I like him. And. One thing that I noticed between episodes is that Richie Covey could actually be generational. I initially passed over him because he was 19 years old, but then a comment on my scouting video reminded me that 19 actually can be generational. They're rare enough that I actually forgot since MLB The Show 23, but the fact that his vision is five higher than his discipline makes me at least want to see if he is. And if he's not, then we wasted just one week of scouting. Not a big deal. As we hop into this critical situation against the Giants, you can see where we rank in these major categories. Nothing above 25th. So we are a very, very bad team. But we're hoping to steal a victory here against the Giants. Down by one, bottom of the ninth. One down, one in scoring position for Michael Chavis. And when the critical situation has us already coming in, bottom of the ninth, we'll show the entirety of the at-bats rather than just the result here. Cutter at 101. I mean, that's a nasty pitch. My goodness. This one hit on the ground by Chavis. Easy play made to first. So we've only got one out left in this game. Here at Hampson, former Rocky. The one to make that out. So it's Max Anderson, the youngest player on our team at 23 years old. On our big league team, of course. We have younger players than that in the organization in the in the minor leagues. Oh, one the count here for Max. He has a hit today. Swing at the slider low and away. It's him behind Owen Sue. In a bad spot here. If we want to try to pull away the victory and the cutter will get strike three and the Giants will win this one. Our first look at our division rival Giants. They are honestly the first team that we have to surpass in this rebuild. You know, there's the Giants who are better than us but are still kind of struggling. Once we pass them, then we move on to trying to surpass guys like the Padres and the Dodgers and the Diamondbacks. So Covey, I do believe, is generational. So shout out to the comment section for helping me 
Uh, remember that this guy could actually be generational. The reason I know, Vision, five higher than Discipline. We scouted him. He dropped down the board. And that gap is 19, which tells me he's going to be an 80 overall generational player. So, very exciting news as we have now a generational player in the class. I don't think I'm going to scout him further just because I have one of our positional needs at third base. So, the the interest will be rising naturally. We're going to scout Luis Perez now over in right field. think he has a chance to be pretty good. Dwayne Anderson in a bit of a bind here. Two men on. We have a one-run lead to protect. Can he finish off the close here? Already two outs. Just needs one more. Going up against Jorge Mateo. Hitting 159. With scoring runners in scoring position. 0 for 4 today. This would be a bad spot to allow a hit. This should be somebody we can close this game off against. Dwayne with eight pitches so far. Cutter is in for strike one. Pitches out and outside with the curveball. So we're getting dangerously close to allowing Luis Arise, who's a much more dangerous hitter. We've got to put away Mateo here, and he walks. That will load the bases and bring up one of the best contact hitters in the game. Luis Arise. Underwood has been a solid closer for us this year. Don't want to see him blow a save today. one -oh pitch is out, and it's over the middle of the plate, but Arise not going to be able to get good contact on it. It's a fly out to left, and the Rockies win. We got a little lucky there, if I do say so myself. That was a pitch left over the middle. Looks like Devin Smeltzer was our starter today. And Marlins had four more hits than us, but we brought home the extra run. Into week nine, Luis Perez looks to be a little bit overrated. Still an okay player, maybe in play with our second pick, should he last. Um, in terms of additional players that I want to scout, Russell Aaron looks to be just an all-around good offensive player. A uh, player that could be around for round two, but I'm still scouting for round one. We can't, you know, depend on the fact that the generational player will slide to us. We pick at four, there's a good chance he's gone. We did discover a decent position player, it looks like here, a switch hitter in Barrett in right field. So we'll definitely scout him at some point soon. We've got ourselves another scenario here. We've got bases loaded for Andrew Moore. Looks like he just came into the game. Or he has zero innings pitch. He might have allowed all these base walkers. No, only five pitches. So there's no way he allowed all these guys. William Contreras... Going to ground out to first, and we get out of the jam here to end the seventh. That could have been very bad for our chances to win. Let's finish this game out. Logan Cerny will draw himself a walk to start the top of the eighth. Bringing up Cespedes, who is somebody that we have not seen much of in this series, and going to get a little bloop single out to right field. Putting runners on the corners. For the Rockies, still no one out. We have to bring home that run. Get an insurance run here. Kevin Newman flies it out to center, but we will tag. And the runner is safe. Cerny in for a fourth Colorado run. Nico Cavadas 0 for 2 today. Going to make that 0 for 3 with a fly ball to left. Two gone here. Top of the eighth. Can Locklear extend the inning? Not likely there. Swinging on that pitch inside the zone, and it is gloved in right. Or the out. Jackson Churio playing right field for the Brewers. One of the top five prospects heading into the start of the series. Of course, he's now had enough MLB time that he's not listed on the prospect list. 
One down here, bottom eight. Another fly out here to center this time. And now we just need one more out to get out of the eighth. And it's going to be a strike three looking for Reese Hoskins. Beautiful pitch. Top of the ninth now. Kobe Thomas up to the plate. Flies out to right. Chavis up. Another pitch inside the swing on, and he is flying to right again. Jackson Churio getting himself some action here. What about Ryan Bliss? Can he come up with something? Not going to happen. A 1-2-3 inning in the ninth, so no additional insurance runs. Underwood going to come in and try to get another save here in the episode. Pop fly to the infield for Ryan Bliss to start the ninth. One out down, two to go. Churio has two hits today. Looking for number three, and he's going to get it. Past the glove of both third and shortstop there. Puts a man on first. Churio with a good game today. Three hits. Rice Terang also going to get down. It. We can't have a rally started by the eighth and ninth hitters, and he's tagged out. Going for a third. Churio getting a little aggressive. And he is thrown out. Beautiful accuracy on that throw. Locklear able to get the glove over just in time for the out. So Yelich up to the plate. Fly out here to left. We'll seal the Rockies victory here in Milwaukee. And that will do it here for our critical situations. Want to keep this episode time, you know, reasonable. And we've got a lot more to cover here with the draft. But it was fun hopping into these critical situations. Something that will continue to sprinkle in a time or two every season. To see some of how these close games close out. But... I think it's time to talk about some call-ups here in the season. I think we're deep enough in to be talking about it. Rafael Murillo has an OPS over 800. He's actually um, going down a little bit, but I still think he's been playing very well enough to get up to AAA. And I think the same can be said for Salas, who's hitting nearly 300, a positive war player, and... Both just 18 years old and playing at AAA, not far from the majors, is a really fun thing to see. Kyle Brown will keep at AA, I think. At 70 overall, you, you, I'm usually looking to make the call up there, but he just hasn't quite been good enough this year, I think. Gordon Beck, um, I think we'll keep him at AA for now as well. Would love to bring him up, though, being 23 years old. Zach Veen, we're not going to call him up to the majors or anything right now. So I'll get the replacements for these two players, and that will be probably all the movement that we're doing in the minors for the moment. We're going to have Drew Romo go down to double-A here at the catcher spot. Has it been great at triple-A? Hopefully he can get things going down at double-A. But Salas and Murillo, both guys that probably won't be in the minor systems for long. Week 10 scouting here. Russell Aaron has pretty much held his rating. I think I'm going to finish this profile off. Still looks to be a very good offensive player. Don't know if the defense is good enough to be in consideration at four, but I don't know if he makes it to 42, which is doubtful. Could be worth it. Week 11 and Russell Aaron, his... Moved up the board dramatically here. Still looking very similar. It's just what I saw in his profile. The scouts are starting to see as well. He's going to be a good all-around offensive player. Power versus lefties is going to be great. We did discover a solid-looking infielder here in the international region, which is pretty cool. Um, we'll go with East now, I suppose. And that will be it for week 11. Week 12, we decided to scout uh, Benjamin Barrett. Forgot to show you that I switched it to him in week 11. But 
he gets a bit of scouting. Somebody that we discovered earlier, not a very good player, unfortunately. Now, our Discovery Scout has found some more players, including Alberto Lopez, who looks really good. Paul Naylor looks pretty good as well. Not as much power as you probably want from first base. The other guys here aren't really anything special. But these two first basemen have potential. I don't know if Naylor's actually a first baseman, but Lopez could be a serious, serious offensive player. Naylor may be more of a second base from kind of what I'm looking at here. But Lopez, I mean, you got to scout Lopez here in week 12. Also decided to put an extra week into both the central and international regions, giving them each six weeks rather than five. I just looked around and there weren't enough interesting individual pitchers that I, I just valued the extra 15% on the two regions that I had scouted. So Lopez, after a bit of scouting, looking a bit worse, but still has the potential to be a really good offensive player and just going to have a cannon of an arm too. Um, that won't, you know, be super utilized at first base, but he does have right field as a secondary, which could be fun. So now that I've given six weeks to each, both the central and international, we're going to find a couple of guys worth getting scouting on. One is going to be Tom Dell, a reliever here. Um, probably the best reliever that we have scouted. Um, discovered, I mean. Now, for this position player, it's really difficult for me. Do we finish the profile on Alberto Lopez? When we have a couple other interesting guys that we've discovered, we have Park here at second base and Naylor here at first. We have two weeks to work with, and I really need four weeks to get these three guys scouted. So how do I use these last two weeks effectively? I think we got to use this week on Naylor just because he, we can get him to 100% in one week. And then in week 14, we'll decide whether to finish Lopez or get some scouting on Park. Now we are here in week 14, the final scouting period. Prior to the draft, the players that we're going to be scouting here are Anton Hernandez. Just want to get that final 15% on him. He is currently the highest ranked Discovery prospect. We'll talk about Discovery a little bit later into this final draft preview, but another guy that's Discovery that we want to get scouted up here. Won't get him, of course, to 100%. Decided to get Park up to 50% rather than getting Lucas up to 100% here. Just getting some scouting on more Discovery options, I think, will be the way to go for us. And then we're just going to take a flyer and see if we can't discover any pitchers in the East in this final week. So with that being said, it's time to take a final look at what this class looks like for us. Now, of course, talked about him towards the top of the episode, but Richie Covey, despite the fact that he doesn't look it here because we didn't fully scout him is a generational prospect at 19 years old. Initially, I looked over him because I forgot that 19 years old could be generational, but the fact that vision is five higher than discipline, the fact that he went down with one week of scouting and that gap is at 19 tells me he's gonna be an 80 overall generational player. So if he makes it to four, there's really no discussion. However, if he doesn't make it to four, this draft has, I think, a pretty interesting conversation. It's a lot like last draft where there was one guy who I liked far above the rest, and then after that, it was a big pool. We have the fourth overall pick, so we have to have four guys that we'd be willing to take. I have probably six um, that I would be willing to take, although in reality, it's probably more like five. And three of them are pitchers, two of them are position players. Already talked about the number one guy, of course being Richie Covey, but after that, guys that I would take, I would say number two would be Jose Barreto here. He has good stamina, hits per nine, velocity is solid, he'll likely throw kind of that mid-90s fastball. Doesn't really have any glaring weaknesses in his game, that's what I like. His strikeouts won't be anything special, that's for sure. 
Um, but 18 years old, I think he has a really good overall to potential gap of 25 that I think that means is a very high likelihood he's going to have a potential. I think if I had to bet on any pitcher in this draft having a potential, I would guess it would be Jose Barreto. And I really want another a potential pitcher. We only have one in the organization right now. And just a well-rounded skill set. Likely to have, you know, starter level stamina. That's exactly what I want. And a pitcher, so Jose Barreto on the top of my pitcher board. Right behind him is Dwayne Perry, who's actually the number one player on our scouts board. The reason I have him one behind uh, Barreto instead is I think there's a higher likelihood that he ends up with like high B potential here, even though that potential range looks really, really good. Just with that overall range where it is, that's a 19 point gap. He has to be in the 70s overall to get A potential. That being said, there's a good chance he is in the 70s overall being the number one ranked player on our board. But like with the, in the case of Barreto, he could be a high 60s overall and still have A potential. So you're not banking on him being, you know, the highest overall he can be to still get the A potential. Whereas Dwayne Perry, if he ends up being a high 60s overall, He's going to have B potential along with it. So uh, I still think he's a very good player. I would take uh, Dwayne Perry um, if Barreto's off the board. These are the two, my two favorite pitchers. The third pitcher in kind of my top five would be Byron Rowe here. Um, really good home runs per nine, walkouts per nine from him. Stamina is going to be elite. Velocity break, all greats. Another guy who just doesn't really have a big weakness. Hits per nine won't be super strong with him solid really good five pitch mix i just think um he's just in third place barely i think he's going to be a very good pitcher whoever takes him is gonna like him i just think you know the overall range uh sorry the potential range is just looking a little bit lower than Barreto and perry and so they both go off the board if it's you know the generational third baseman and both of these pitchers he could certainly be in play for us the other positional player that I think is in play is Jason Lindsay, the 18 year old outfielder out of Venezuela. Now he does not provide power, but he looks to provide pretty much everything else. He won't have a spectacular arm either, but speed, stealing, fielding, reaction, contact and plate skills. He'll have all of that. You know, we are a Rockies franchise and we do prioritize power but you still need you know that lead off hitter you know not all nine players need to have power having a really good on base player to lead off your lineup i still think has a lot of value um and jason Lindsay looks to be somebody that can be a asset at center field with his fielding and speed as well as a good lead off hitter the arm will need a little bit of development. It's not going to be great, but I think it'll be good enough that with training, he can have a good center field arm. And then you just accept the fact that you don't have power with this player. And I think he can be a really, really good option. That's really who's in play at number four. Um, there was a third baseman that I liked a lot in Steven Cruz. Just provided a lot of power with a big arm and... Uh, at least solid, you know, not awful contact and play skills, but um, he's injured. And just as the draft went along, we found better players. So he's likely off the board now. Talking at 42, a uh, position player that's going to be on our short list there is Russell Aaron. I don't think it's super likely that he actually makes it. Um, he's, you know, in the top 10 of our rankings, and I'm sure somebody else scouted him so he'll likely be off the board but if he's there gonna be a very strong option has excellent power particularly against lefties he'll have solid plate skills and contact defense is really gonna be just something that he doesn't have great of at least with the arm and the reaction the fielding itself will be solid um the fact that he has first base secondary i think makes that more appealing because then the you know sub part Defense doesn't matter as much, but a five foot seven, one sixty five pound first baseman it would uh, certainly be funny. But he's going to be on the short list should he make it to forty two. Other than that, we're likely looking pitcher at forty two. 
Um, very unlikely, but if Rowe makes it, um, that could be an option. Um, Matthew Marlin, he is injured, so it would be a big risk. It could turn out to be a total bust should we take him. But I think that the fact that he's injured does put that in play. The CPU does let injured players fall down the board a little bit from what I've seen and looks really good. So do you take the risk with the injury there or do you take someone that's maybe a little bit safer? You have an older prospect here in Herb Rays, but his potential is going to be excellent. Um, the one guy here, Anton Hernandez in Discovery, he could be a really good option. I have excellent stamina and velocity and just kind of an all around it's for nine. Um, I think there are a lot of solid pitching options come pick 42. Even Jesse Snowden going to be much more of a long term project. So maybe he's a, even later than that. But really, other than Russell Aaron, there's not anybody I'm super excited about at 42. There are a couple more discovery guys. Alberto Lopez here, who we have at 50. 5% uh, scouted. He could be an option at 42. I'd love if we could take him in with one of those picks in the 70s. That's kind of where a lot of our discovery position players will come into play. We'll see what happens when we scout Raymond Park here. But with Lopez and Paul Naylor, those two picks in the 70s, I think, will be good spots to kind of maybe take our final position players after that, it will be more pitcher focused. Now, there's one thing I got to say about this class is that the discovery was not very strong. Our highest ranked discovery player is Anton Hernandez. We got nobody that's a top 10 player on the board out of discovery. That's pretty rare. But even more rare than that is that the second best player from discovery is all the way at 38. And we didn't even get him fully scouted. So... I just want you guys to be prepared right now that this draft probably isn't going to have the same kind of depth that we had in last year where discovery was awesome. We had players ranked in our top 25 that we were taking all the way rounds one through five in that draft. It's just not going to be the case this time around unless we get extremely lucky with discovery again. And even so, these guys are more ranked kind of around 50 and that's just a different caliber of player that you're talking about the guys that are ranked by your team board you know in the 50s and the guys that are top 25 so um i think we still have a chance to get really good players at 4 and 42 for sure very confident in those two picks that we'll be able to nail them but after that you're starting to get pretty risky i think here in this class and uh, we'll either just have to get lucky or we'll just have to accept that we might not be getting, you know, six future plus starters in one single draft like we did last year. So that will wrap up the final draft preview for the episode. Let's just quickly go through and see how players are doing this year and how their ratings are increasing. Rafael Murillo. Really good start in AAA. He continues to go up an absolute ton. He is honestly pretty much ready for the majors already, but we want to ensure that he has success. We'll at least keep him down in the minors for the rest of this year, but I would not be surprised if he gets spring training invite ahead of his age 19 season. Dolander, a guy who is not far from getting called up. I think, you know, September call-ups, he's already on the 40-man roster. Makes a lot of sense for Dolander. He is impressed at every single chance he's gotten here in this franchise. He was invited to spring training this last year. Was really good then. Has dominated both AA and AAA. He's ready for the big leagues pretty soon here. Salas, another guy who might be getting himself a spring training invite in the off season. Um, not showing a ton of power in the hitting so far, um, but we're hoping that can continue to develop. He does have plus four power versus righties this year, so you like to see that. Um, and Zach Veen 
His numbers are a little bit more stagnant this year, has not gone up in overall at all. So likely somebody that will be waiting one more year for Thompson. Um, I, oh, did it not save when I put him up to AAA? That is unfortunate. I did do this episode over a couple different recordings, didn't record it all at once. So it looks like he has stayed in AA. I'm going to move him back up to AAA right now and I'll make sure that we save it. Um, up to a 70 overall, I think he is another guy who has a chance to be in the bigs before too long here. Um, Brian Doe, 17 homers on the year, plus four power versus righties. Um, over a thousand OPS, my goodness, and his potential has gone up to A. So big time season for Brian Doe, plus eight contact versus righties, plus five contact versus lefties. Um, he's been very, very impressive. We have to take a, a deeper look at him at some point in this season. Um, we haven't done it before the draft, but we're 100% going to follow this guy at some point down the stretch of this season. He has been insanely good. Kyle Brown, just not not an impressive first season from him. It's fine. You know, he just got drafted, but hoping to see better stuff from him as the year goes along and into next year, but likely to stay at first, uh, sorry, at double A throughout the rest of the season for the MLB roster. We'll just quickly go through here. Uh, the top, uh, top pitchers are still doing pretty dang good. I'm actually going to go and do it this way for the major league roster just to get some averages, some leaders here. We have Carlos Perez, who's leading us in average, the only one over 250 for us on the season. And that's in, you know, not a full time role by any means. Um, in home runs, we are being led by Tyler Locklear, who has 10 on a bit of a cold streak here. Cavadas with eight. Sereny has seven. Kevin Newman with seven. In terms of batting guys in, it's Locklear and Ryan Bliss for us. His numbers, um, not as good as when he started, but they're starting to get pretty solid here, I would say. Uh, OPS here, Perez getting in the lead. Newman here. In terms of drawing walks, it's been Michael Chavis leading us there. Let's talk about war, shall we? Anybody doing well? Kevin Newman is our best player at war. He has a one war. And we have a lot of guys in the negatives. So despite the fact that Locklear has led us in power, just the fact that he's not very good defensively has, has hurt him. He's also just not hitting lefties well at all. He's been mashing righty-righty a bit, but terrible against lefties, which is surprising considering he's a right-handed hitter here, but not a lot of standout players on the MLB roster. That's to be expected. You know, again, said it before, but this is a Rule 5 team. Not a lot is expected of this team. If we could find one or two gems here to, to keep long-term on this roster, then I'd be happy with it. So pitching-wise, uh, Dennis Santana has been our worst pitcher. So not likely to bring him back. Same with Chris Rodriguez. Some of these guys that have been very bad. Um, we just won't bring back. But in terms of pitchers that are playing well, Devin Smeltzer, um, 316 ERA with 122 whip. Um, he's been playing himself into coming back next year for sure, I think. Especially because he's a lefty pitcher, which we just don't have a lot of in the organization. Dwayne Underwood has been... A good closer for us. 18 saves is three blown saves. Overton, 358, 132. Solid. And Moreno here in 40 innings. Uh, ERA looks better than his whip for sure. 166 whip is a bit high. And so a couple, we're looking a little bit better pitching, I would say, than hitting, which is surprising for you know the Colorado Rockies. But we also just have higher overall players. Uh, pitching than we do hitting so there you have it that's gonna do it for this episode of our colorado rockies 
draft only franchise let me know who you think we should draft if richie covey the generational third baseman isn't there because of course he's the guy that we should draft if he is but uh draft will be coming up soon and i'll see you then